Yeah, I'm here to talk about what we do and all goes wrong. Um, and sadly, for many of us in the room, and us on a regular basis as a supporting consultancy, we see it go wrong a lot. So we're going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, why build a cyber incident response plan? You know, why prepare to deal with that misery in such a structured way? Um, and the short answer to that really is, as I'm sure you're all aware, is um, this little lot, and many folks like them, um, the joy of Lockbit, Conties of the world, and also the Black Cats, and the many, many more who sit behind them. I think it's fair to say that Lockbit have changed the landscape with their approach. They've certainly commercialised it. They've brought in ethics, which is a really challenging question. Um, and they've stood by those ethics as well, which is really interesting. When they've been tested, they've stood by them. They've given people, like the Canada Canadian Kids Hospital, they gave the keys back because one of their affiliates stepped out of line, the affiliate got binned. And they've paid back people in the US ransomware demands because their data ended up on the dark web. But also, you'll see some of the more subtle changes is at the bottom here, like Black Cat advertising their exfiltration tool upgrade. And we're now starting to see data exfiltration and without ransomware encryption being deployed, which proves to be a very challenging thing to deal with from a customer perspective because you, they have all your data, they'll threaten to sell it, they'll basically blackmail you. We refer to them as data kidnap because we don't have anything else to refer to. Actually, that's about it. But yeah, that's the challenge. These guys and the rate of knots which they're going through the marketplace. And their marketplace is huge, by the way. In statistical terms, you are more likely to sustain a ransomware incident via a third-party supply chain. Someone who provides a platform, an application, or a solution to you. If we go back BC, before COVID, we were probably seeing 7 out of 10 ransomware attacks with directly on a client, directly. Certainly post-COVID today, we're seeing more like seven out of 10 attacks being on a supply chain. Simple economics, you know, you get one, the pressure that's brought to bear on that one by all of those people is huge. Um, and when that happens, all you will have left is your communication tools. Your IT department can't help, your data protection officer can't help, your CISO can't help, your CTO can't help. We can't help, nobody can help. You're simply left with your comms tool. And for that, you need a whole business response plan. Plain and simple, not complicated. You've got to get everybody behind this. So, what does a cyber incident response plan deliver to you guys? Well, its structure and its process and its named responsibilities. A CERP is unusual from a policy procedure planning point of view in as much as that it contains named individuals with named responsibilities. I write a lot of policy and procedure in my life. I see a lot of policy and procedure. And it's unusual to have a named individual. Job roles, yes. Named individuals are very rare. We have to have clear ownership of response tasks. By the way, I'm not talking about IT here. I'm not talking about data protection. I'm talking about HR. I'm talking about comms. I'm talking about operational management. I'm talking about all the people in your business, all your clients, and everything that goes with it. We need to work on predefined lines of communication. So all those people who've got tasks know who they're talking to know how they get there, and if things go really, really badly, we have back-channel communication methods. I just reviewed a fairly significant cyber incident response plan that a client had written for themselves for a major piece of infrastructure in the north of England yesterday. And it never crossed their minds that they might lose their email. They made the assumption that 365 would be up, breathing and running, and everybody could talk to each other and share documents. You know, that's not the case. It does happen. So again, we need preset back-channel communications, i.e. how do we talk to each other as a CERT response team, how do we talk to senior management, how do we talk to stakeholders and people who work for us. We often find that the people who work in the business are often left out of this process and not actually involved in the communications plan. And we've seen some fairly serious failures where members of staff have said something, let's just say inappropriate to a customer or a client. We had one where someone said, I think we're being subject to a ransomware attack. They weren't. One of their supply chain customers was, but they were not. Then all hell cut loose in that business. We need communications plans. Not detailed things, but we need high level communication plan strategy and structure so people can actually drop onto that, backfill it, and move it out quickly. We need functional department response plans. This week, I sat talking to head of finance for a very large organization whose finance system was SAP, outsourced, managed, third party, who was under the assumption that IT could just simply restore it and back it up. 
major management teams still don't understand that a lot of their applications are not under the control of their IT departments. That's still pretty common knowledge. Those playbooks need to be, what are our workarounds? How do we cope? We need to work out what do we do as an organization if that system disappears for one day, five days, 10 days, forever. We've had clients who've had extinction events on data. A local council does in North England, Red Car Council, lost every last thing they ever had. Everything, nothing left. They had to go and knock on doors to find out who people were, where they lived, and what house they were in. We need to define systems dependencies. Most businesses I walk into don't understand what their dependency is on a system or an application or a tool. They just have never thought about it. And when you go through that process, you'll find there are some surprises in there. I had a loan working one with the housing associations last few weeks. If they lose loan working, they're not allowed to proceed other than in pairs. So they reduce their efficiency by 50% immediately on their maintenance staff. So that's a dependency. We also need to think about risk acceptance. We have to accept that some of these systems and applications, we're just going to have to wait for them to come back. And the great work example of that is Microsoft. You're not going to develop something else. You're not going to put Google in behind it or put something else, back it all up. You're just going to sit and wait until it comes back. And your management teams need to understand that. That they will not have email, they will not have certain applications. And it just, it's not just the Microsofts of the world, it's the SAPs, it's the Oracles, it's the big guys. We can't put other applications in that quickly in dependencies. What you need to be left with is a business that understands its risks and they're in plain sight. So no one gets a fright or a shock or is shouting at people when things go wrong because that's what happens. So I'll spend a bit more time on this. So how do we build out a cyber incident response plan? Well, it's quite a prescriptive task, if we're being honest. Typically, we would look at how assemble that SERP team. What does that SERP team look like? It needs functional, broad management representation from the board to the functional areas. And we need to have a SERP team leader and deputies. We should never, ever appoint IT or data protection as a team leader. They're likely to be busy. Even if it's a third party, they're going to be busy checking nothing's crossed over into their world, that this is not a wider thing, talking to their peer groups, doing all the checks and balances that IT and data protection will be doing. And we normally kick it off with a meeting, get everybody on board, and it's at the point which I kind of explain to these people what the real world is and what you need to do and what you need to think about. That whole business team is critical. Absolutely critical. It has to be everybody on board. You know, HR will go, well, what's it do with, to do with me? Yeah, all the people. Comms, what's it do with me? We're going to have to talk to an awful lot of people very, very quickly. Comms is king here. If you lose control of the comms, you lose control of the incident. And we have seen this on an epic scale in our client base when it goes horribly wrong. And that functional department representation, because they're the people who understand how their systems work. They know what their dependencies are. They know how things hang together. They know what will stop them in the tracks. They've probably already got a bunch of informal workarounds, by the way, because they've probably suffered something before. So we need to think about it in those terms. And that SERP team needs to be wholly involved in that process all the way through, in the development of that, the response templates, the communication plans, who does what, how they do their back channel, where they get to stuff, do they use WhatsApp, do they use Nimbox, do they use the likes of send word now to inform staff, what do they do to actually physically do it. Then we look at the systems. What systems do you have? And what dependencies do you have on there? We use a pretty simple approach based upon experience rather than kind of any standard. We ask a few simple questions, obvious ones, you know, um, is it on site, is it on premise, is it up in the cloud, where does it live, who's got ultimate responsibility for making it work? Um, we ask what happens for one day, what happens for five days, if you go north of 10 days, what's the impact, work out around that. Is this a system where we accept risk? You know, simple stuff like that, like Microsoft. Um, we also look at what workarounds we can get in place and you know, we'll actually risk assess those in respect to the business, not just from a security point of view, but from a data protection point of view, ICO type stuff. And those actions can list out quite extensively. Um, you know, you have a departmental, local level SERP, cyber response plan. So again, if you've got a large dis distributed organization, your local finance department, your local operations department, your local maintenance folks, they're probably gonna need a response plan. You've got your central one, which is dealing with all the big stuff, but they've lost the system and they need to work in another way. So we've got to help them work in another way. That may include some remediation, i.e. we need to put some backup systems in place. Um, we need to do due diligence on these third party providers. You'd be amazed, the lack of due diligence on third parties for people who are providing platforms that are absolutely business critical. ICO has got a real, real axe to grind on this at the moment. So that due diligence on those third parties um, 
Yeah, you have to take the reasonable face value, but we need to be looking at things like CE+, plus, things like ISO 27001. We need to be looking at them for plans, procedures, how they're going to talk to you. If it goes wrong, what's their comms plan? Because in our experience, when a third party gets busted, they go dark. I mean, they literally just shut the shop. Every single time it's happened. I've never seen one yet that communicated immediately. And the problem with that is, you're left in the dark as well, so you, do, you can't plan. Often they're trying to find out what's going on, what was ransomware, what the extent of it is, and we understand that. But actually, a lot of the time, it's like anything in our personal lives. You know, if the, the car's broken, the washing machine's broken, often that phone call to say, yeah, we understand and we are on our way is more than enough to keep you in a good, good place. Comms, 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 comms. We worked out, way back in the day, before COVID, we used to use the um, kind of, you know, technical response plan approach. Ransomware readiness, how we're going to deal with it. We realised very quickly, the hard way, by the way, that that wasn't what fixed the situation. Because the IT folks will get on with stuff, the data protection folks will get on with stuff, the departments will work around it, they'll do what they can, but the comms out to the wider marketplace, to media, to all those people is absolutely critical. Contract review, again, you, know, you see service level agreements in contracts today of 95%, that's an awful lot of days missing. We've had a situation where a client supplier restored their systems post the ransomware event because they were well, well set up, they restored their systems, restored their data, and they were back up and running in absolutely no time at all. They were inside of their service level agreement. Then Lockwood said, ah, that's lovely, but we're still gonna sell all your client data. So, you know, and the, the third party turned around and said, well, we've, we've met our service level agreement. So you get into legals then and all that horrible stuff. So, risk acceptance, draft that SERP up, identify the stakeholders, third parties, people we need to talk to, um, add those system dependencies in there so we know what we're dealing with, draft those department, department level SERPs, agree response owners, make sure people know exactly what they're going to do, when they're going to do it, um, link them to your BCP, your DR, and your breach procedures and policies and plans, then it's not the same thing. One can kick the other off, and the other one can kick that off, all vice versa, it's all mutually supportive. Then tabletop test. Absolutely critical, the tabletop test. You know, you need to test it in a room and stress that business out and give them a hard time. I'd run tabletops all the time, and it's the only way I get my own back if I'm on a half time. So, but it's really nice to grind someone at the ground if they've been nasty to you. Um, revise those SERPs to make them better. Repeat annually and update the SERP. You've got to repeat and update because people may change, because this is such a people thing. So if people come along, then you, know, you need to get them up to speed. Roles change, people move on, new people come in, that kind of stuff. This is not a big process. Typically for us, we deliver this in between five and 15 days for most clients. You know, this is not a big investment. The real value is the awareness that it creates in the organization. It's not the piece of paper at the end, if I'm being honest. It's the awareness it creates in those departments and it gets people to pre-think those things that may happen and how they're gonna deal with them. However, I'll leave you with something because I'm getting pushed for time from the back. By a far smarter man than me, who's even older than me, which is something, um, but it does really nail the cyber incident response plan kind of um, situation, how we need to think about stuff. Because at the end of the day, sadly, in this room, about one third of this room is gonna suffer. Just looking at rough numbers here. Based on our client base, about one third is gonna suffer. I'm sat this morning, I'm sat there, dealing with a breach for a client, for a hotel chain. They had one yesterday as well, that's two, two on the bounce. And that's, that's, that's really slack, that. And they're, they're a good business, they're well structured, they're well ordered, they've got seen, they've got all the good stuff, but they've been busted twice in two days. As ever, human error, but that's another conversation. Any questions? Yes? Is there an element of chaos management within all this? Right? Because people don't tend to, or maybe it's good, it's planned, it's good, table top tests and all that's good. Yeah. It's similar to a fire drill, right? Yes. People will be following that. And when a real incident happens, a lot of chaos, people will be asking questions, yeah. external calls. Many times that's missing Yeah, getting the chaos out of the room is really quite difficult. And when we run the tabletop, um, whoever's the, the team leader, um, it's their job to keep that chaos suppressed. Um, and again, we, we, that's, why it's, we, that's why our approach is so prescriptive. Like Mark is gonna go and do this, Rob's gonna go and do that, Kate's gonna go and do that. They're gonna check it with the team leader, then they're gonna do it. They already know what they're gonna go and do. So it's kind of, it's just to remove that chaos, because human beings love structure. As much as we don't think that, we do love structure. Any more questions? No? Good. <laughs> <laughs>